Good morning. Good morning. This is our 2023-2024 Jet Tax Boot Camp. We are back, ready to kick back off at section 2.4. I'll be taking a look at my chat from time to time. Looks like Tweety Bird says good morning, everyone. Good morning, Tweety Bird. Morning back to you. Appreciate that. Thank you for using the chat. All right, if you guys can hear my audio and we're good to go, go ahead and drop a one in the chat. Y'all know we're going to keep this thing interactive. You guys going to be dropping stuff in the chat the whole time. I got to make sure y'all not sleeping on me. 2.4. 2.4. Today is December 2nd. 2.4. Traditional IRAs. An individual retirement arrangement or IRA is a personal savings plan allowing a taxpayer to set aside money for retirement while offering tax advantages. Taxpayers meeting certain qualifications can deduct some or all of the contributions to an IRA. Some or all. Can't necessarily write all off or all of it off because there is limits on how much you can put in there. Remember, the government is not trying to allow you to go work, make money in America, and then hide all your money into something where you're not paying no taxes. An individual of any age can make a traditional IRA contribution as long as the individual has compensation. Contributions to contribute to an IRA. Taxpayer must have taxable compensation such as wages, salaries, commissions, tips, bonuses, or net income from self-employment. For IRA purposes, compensation also includes taxable alimony and separate maintenance payments received by an individual and any non-taxable combat pay received by a member of the U.S. Armed Forces for IRA purposes. Taxpayers may also treat excluded difficulty of care payments as compensation, as well as certain non-taxable, excuse me, as well as certain taxable non-tuition fellowship and stipend payments. Remember, you know, if you have certain types of fellowship and stipend and scholarships, certain types of them are not considered to be tax-free. They're considered to be taxable, which means if they're taxable, I can use them to be considered as compensation for the purpose of putting money into an IRA or making an IRA contribution. All right. The most a taxpayer can contribute to a traditional IRA is the smaller of $6,500, or you can do $7,500 if you're age 50 or older. They'll let you put a little bit more in because they know you're getting closer to your retirement age. If a taxpayer files a joint return and their taxable compensation is less than that of their spouse, the maximum contribution for the year to the taxpayer's IRA is the smaller of, which is the same, 6500 or 7500 if you're 50 or older. Therefore, the total combined contributions for the year to the taxpayer's IRA and the spouse's IRA could be as much as 13,000 if you put them 6,500 for each spouse together, or it could be up to 14,000 because you know, you may have one doing 6,500, the other one doing 7,500. Or it could even be 15,000 because both of them might be over age 50 and both of them putting in 7,500 a piece. Deductibility, if neither the taxpayer nor the spouse is covered by a qualified retirement plan at work, all right, so don't let these people fool you. If you got a, you see box two, or excuse me, box 12 on the W-2, and they have a retirement plan at work, and they want to go and try to slide money into IRA and get that right off as well. Listen to what it says here. If neither the spouses are qualified by a retirement plan at any time during the year, the taxpayer can take a deduction for the total contributions equal in the total amount. Okay, now for a married filing jo- uh, jointly couple with unequal compensation, the deduction for the spouse with less income is limited to sixty five hundred. All right, so whoever makes the least can put sixty five hundred in. The deduction for contributions are subject to a phase out if the taxpayer is an active participant in an employer sponsored retirement plan. So that mean that doesn't mean you can't put anything in an IRA. It means if you have a retirement plan at work, you, the money that you're allowed to put in there will be limited. All right, so let's take a look at your Maggie limits, which is your modified adjusted gross income. Maggie is modified adjusted gross income. So what is the Maggie? 
It's your adjusted gross income or your Aggie. It's your Aggie plus the IRA deduction itself. So your modified adjusted gross income is your Aggie plus the IRA, adjusted gross income. When married, the deduction is calculated separately for each spouse. But if you take a look down here, here's the amounts for when it starts to phase out. You can see how much money you, you need to be making. You're over 218000 Then, of course, it's time for you to start putting money into uh, something to try to get out of them taxes. Government's going to expect for you to go ahead and pay them taxes. Distributions. If you have money in an IRA and then you take money out, there's a lot of people that were struggling during the uh, pandemic and having a lot of tough times with the economy, and they're taking money out of their retirements. Distribution from an IRA is reported on Form 1099-R. We get a lot of people when we're doing tax returns that are cashing in their retirements. They may not even have a lot. They may not have two, 300000 They may only have five or ten grand, but they needed to survive. You have to put that on the tax return, and they will pay taxes on that. All right, in general, distributions, meaning taking money out of the IRA, are taxable in full the year you received it. If the taxpayer made any non-deductible contributions in prior years, that part will be taken out. If a traditional IRA contains non-deductible contributions, a distribution from any of the taxpayer's traditional IRA is partly non-taxable and partly taxable, which means there are possibilities for you to take some of the money out with it not being taxable. But for the most part, you pull money out of retirement, you're going to pay tax on that, buddy. All right, if the taxpayer... Here's the most thing, most important thing. Drop 59.5 in the chat for me. 59.5 if you're still awake. The taxpayer received any distributions out of, a, out of a traditional IRA before you reach the age of 59 and a half. The distributions are subject to a 10% early distribution tax. So the money was put in the IRA and you never paid taxes on any of that money while you were doing that, all right? While you were putting money in that IRA and while you were working all those years and putting that money away, you were not paying taxes on it. Well, when you get ready to pull the taxes out, at that point, now you're going to have to pay the taxes on that money. But on top of the taxes, you also have to pay a 10% penalty because you took it out too early. Taking it out too early will cause you to have to pay a 10% penalty, an extra 10% penalty. So that's a lot. So you take out 10 grand out of your retirement, not only are you gonna pay taxes on that 10 grand, but you're gonna pay another $1,000, which is 10%, Jesus Christ, it's a lot of taxes. 10% tax on that 10,000 you took out. Okay. All right. Age 59 and a half. 10% penalty. All right. Qualified charitable distribution. Now, we're not probably going to know a lot of people that are doing this, but let's cover it anyway, just in case. An otherwise taxable IRA distribution is excludable from your gross income to the extent of a direct transfer to a qualified charitable organization. The amount excludable cannot exceed 100,000 a year. What does this mean? Let's break this thing down Barney style, Dr. Gino. That just means if you take money out of retirement, you're paying taxes and extra penalties, but you won't pay any taxes at all if you take it out to give it to charity. That's pretty much what it means. A Roth IRA. We just talked about a traditional IRA. Now we're gonna talk about Roth because they are very different. All right, we're talking about a Roth. Now, Roth IRA are generally subject to the same rules as traditional IRAs. But to be a Roth IRA, the account must be designated as a Roth when it is opened. So you can't just change your mind and say, well, I have a Roth now. No, 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 no. It's whatever type of account was created. Taxpayer can contribute to a Roth IRA in the same year as a contribution to a traditional. So you can contribute to both of them if you want to. All right, the maximum contribution to any one or a combination is still the same amount. The maximum contributions to any one or the same is still gonna be the same amount, which is the 
6,500 or 7,500 if you're over 50, all right? It's the same amount. So you're not going to slide by and think you're going to put even more money in there. You can't do that. With 401ks, you can do a little different than what you can do with these IRAs, but IRAs will only allow you to do this, do this much. Now, you see there's a phase out where it starts to phase out based on how much money you make. And here are the phase out limits. Remember, Maggie is modified adjusted gross income. What is your Maggie? Anybody remember what the Maggie is? It's your adjusted gross income plus you put back in the IRA deductions. You have to consider the IRA deductions. Distributions from a Roth IRA. We're talking about Roth now. A taxpayer's income do not, does not include qualified distributions from a Roth. You hear what that said? You can take money out of a Roth and you don't pay taxes on it. Didn't I tell you with the traditional, you got to pay taxes on it and an extra 10% penalty? With this one, you don't pay taxes when you take it out. You know why? Because you already paid the taxes on it before you put it in. The difference between the traditional and the Roth is with that traditional, you sliding by not paying no taxes in there. You just put that money over in that traditional IRA. Well, I'm going to dodge these taxes. I ain't paying these taxes on this part of my money. I made $500,000 this year, but I'm going to put this $6,500 over here in this traditional IRA, and I ain't going to pay no taxes on that. With a Roth, is different. You get your paycheck, you get all your money, and you are taxed on all of it, and then you put your money in retirement because you already paid the taxes. You don't have to worry about paying the taxes. But if you take it out early, you still have a penalty. But if you wait until age 59 and a half, which is what the purpose of these things are, these the purpose of the traditional IRA and the Roth IRA is for you to utilize that money when you're in retirement age, when you're over 59 and a half. So if you use it for what it's for, you don't have to pay any taxes on it when you take it out. So imagine the difference is with a traditional IRA, if you have $500,000 that you saved in there all your life while you were working, with a traditional IRA, you will probably have about $100,000 worth of taxes. But with a Roth IRA, you've already paid the taxes. If you got $500,000 in there, you can pull out $500,000, no taxes, if you're age 59 and a half. See, I wanted to skip past this to go a little bit faster, make sure we get more work done today. But you have to be over 59 and a half, okay? If the distribution to you, meaning I pull money out, you're over 59 and a half, okay? All right, let's take a look at an example. Taxpayer's five-year period begins on January 1st, 2023 for any first-time regular contributions made between 23 and 24 for the 23 tax year. The taxpayer's five-year period is satisfied in 2028. Now, what this five-year period is talking about is here. All right. When you start looking at these rules, you have to be made over 59 and a half, or if you were disabled, or if you made to an estate, or if it's a first time home buyer, but you have to have been in it for five years, okay? So in order to make the distribution not taxable, you have to satisfy both of these conditions. The distribution has to occur after the five year period and Let's see, the distribution occurs after the five-year period in which you contributed to the Roth IRA for the benefit and it has to be one of these items down here, okay? So you have to at least let it be there for five years. And all that means is very simply, you can't just be putting it in and taking it out and putting it in and taking it out and putting it in and taking it out. That's not going to work. All right, the 10% additional tax on the early distribution does not apply to the amount included in income on a conversion to a Roth IRA, okay? So you can convert it from a traditional to a Roth, all right? Reporting distributions. Fully taxable distributions are reported on Form 1040, Line 4B. No entry is required for Line 4A if only the part of the distribution is taxable. The total distribution is entered on Line 1040, Line 4A. So you put line 4A, how much did you was distributed to you? How much did I take out? And then line B, you put the taxable part. Rollovers. I think we talked about rollovers on our last video, but I'll cover it again. A taxpayer can withdraw tax-free all or part of the assets from one traditional IRA if the taxpayer reinvests those, those monies within 60 days. 
So even though you take money out of these things, they hit you with taxes and they hit you with additional pen penalty. Oh, somebody's trying to come in. Thank you. Appreciate that. Even though you can get hit with penalties and you can get hit with taxes by bringing that money out, you can actually still go ahead and pull that money out as long as you put it into another fund within 60 days. So if you got some kind of business going on and you need to use that money, you can put it back in 60 days, fine. Or if you're just moving it from one company to another, that's the traditional rollover. I don't want to be with Fidelity anymore. I want to be with Charles Schwab. All right? You report the rollovers on 1040 as well. Required minimum distributions or RMDs. We talked about this in our first video when we looked at the recent tax law changes, okay? The recent tax law changes start talking about the age that you needed to be before you were required to start pulling some of that money out. That's all it is. Taxpayers must begin required minimum distributions by requiring, excuse me, by a required beginning date from qualified plans and traditional IRAs. The rules do not apply to Roth IRAs. After starting year for the RMDs, Taxpayer must receive the RMD for each year by December 31st. So what does that mean? You can't just put that money in there all your life, four, five hundred, six hundred thousand, a million dollars, two million, ten million, whatever, and don't pay no taxes on it because the government at some point is going to say, you are now required to start taking some of that money out, sir. Ma'am, you need to start taking some of that money out because we haven't had an opportunity to tax that yet. We need you to start taking that money out. All right. And the penalty is very high. If a taxpayer fails to make your RMD or your required minimum distribution, which is your required minimum takeout, money takeout, the taxpayer is subject to a 25% penalty on the amount of money that would have been required to be distributed, but it wasn't, okay? Now, when we talked about this with the recent tax law changes, the reason why we brought it up is because it's a new law. The update to the tax law has changed it now to where it's a 25% penalty, but it used to be 50%. That's a lot. That's a lot. Imagine you were supposed to take some, some of your own money out of a fund, out of an IRA by a certain age, and you didn't do it. And because you didn't do it and pay the taxes, they hit you with the taxes and a 50% penalty. That means 50% of the money belongs to the government. Well, they've changed it now. It's only 25%. That's still a hefty penalty because you could be paying taxes on it and paying a 25% penalty on top of that. That's crazy. All right, qualified plans. For qualified plans, taxpayers who are not 5% owners of the employer maintaining the plan must begin RMDs by April 1st on the year of the calendar year when you turn 73. All right, so for the most part, that's going to apply to everybody. You're just going to be mainly going to be age 73. You see how the ages have changed based on what year it was. Well, we're in 2023 20, now. So after 2022, you see now everything starts to become uh, up until age, up until the year 2033, the age is going to be 73. All right. Note, the plan may require the taxpayer to begin RMDs by April 1st of the year that follows the year when the taxpayer reaches 73, even if the taxpayer has not retired, which means you're not going to just keep on working either. You don't finish just keep on working. You done put a million dollars in this thing. The government ain't never had no chance to tax it. And you like, no, nah, no, nah, play. I'm going to keep on working. Y'all ain't going to get me. Oh, yes, the hell they are. The government going to be sending you an email saying, hell no. To the no, no. All right. Traditional IRAs. For a traditional IRA, the required beginning date for an IRA owner to start RMDs is April 1st, following the year when you reach a specific age, even if the taxpayer begins receiving distributions before attaining that age. So what does that mean? What that means is even if you've already started taking money out of the plan at a certain age, that's not going to let you slide because you are required to take out a specific amount, the required minimum distribution, meaning if they require you to take out five grand and you only took out two grand, they finna hit you on taxes for that other three grand that you should have took out that you didn't. And they finna hit you with a 
tax on top of your regular taxes. Inherited. Let's talk about inherited IRAs. All right. You know, nobody wants to talk about death. Especially not when they're talking about taxes, death and taxes. But ladies and gentlemen, we live in a real world. This is not a movie. This is not a cartoon. People die. So most individuals that inherited an IRA are required to completely withdraw all planned assets within 10 years of the date of death. Meaning if you inherit an IRA or one of your tax clients inherits an IRA, they're not going to slide by too. Because the person who died might have never paid taxes on that money. And they're like, shoot, man, my granddaddy left me 500000 left me a million living in this IRA. I ain't, I ain't paying no taxes on that money either. I'm going to pass it on down to my kids. Oh, no, the hell you ain't. Hell no. You are required to completely withdraw all planned assets within 10 years. So what does that mean? Let's break it down, Barney Style, Dr. Gino. All that means is you're going to pull that money out at some point, and you're going to pay taxes on it, player. And on top of that, um, if you want to take what you have left and put it into your own IRA, you can. But this IRA is going to be dissolved. It's going to be taken care of. It's got to get gone. All right, let's talk about recharacterizations. The current rule allows a contribution for one type of IRA to be recharacterized if the contribution to the other type of IRA does not apply to a conversion to a Roth. This means the taxpayer cannot treat the Roth conversion as if it never happened. The taxpayer may contribute to a traditional IRA and then convert it to convert that traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, but the taxpayer is precluded from later unwinding the conversion through a recharacterization. What does that mean? Break it down, Dr. Gino. All that means is you can convert from a traditional to a Roth, but you can't undo it. You can be flipping, flopping back and forth like that. We ain't doing that. Hell no. Oh. 2.5. 2.5. Unemployment compensation. Unemployment compensation. Now, this sounds very simple, but a lot of people had problems with unemployment compensation the last two years doing taxes because the government was giving out a lot more unemployment, longer unemployment, and because they were doing it so much of that, a lot of people's forms were wrong, and they had to redo those forms. A lot of people had to pay back some of the unemployment. So just remember to make sure you read that 1099G very carefully. Unemployment compensation is paid on a periodic basis and is usually computed based on a formula of the taxpayer's length of prior employment and wages. Form 1099G. Drop a G in the chat for me. If you're still awake, drop a G in the chat for me. 1099G. All right. That's the form. That's going to come in when they get unemployment. All right. All right. You know that's taxable. And if they had a W-2 at any point during the year, you're going to add that unemployment on top of it. And any money they pulled out of retirement. So always encourage your tax clients to let the government take taxes out of the unemployment. It's already damn near free money. You get money from the government. You're not working for it. The least you can do is let them take taxes on it out of it. So you don't make life worse for yourself later. When you finally do get to working again and you add your W-2 money on top of that money, and now you got to pay taxes on all this unemployment money and no taxes have been paid out of it. Encourage them to allow that to happen. However, be good at giving your clients bad news. If they took that unemployment money and didn't pay no taxes on it, maybe they had a good reason to. If they didn't have any work at all during that entire year, it won't hurt them at all. It, it probably won't hurt them very much at all. You know, because a family trying to survive on unemployment, that's not a lot. But they probably won't end up having to pay any taxes on it if that's all they had. But most people don't. It doesn't work out that way. You have some kind of work and income coming throughout the year to go along with that unemployment. So encourage them to pay taxes on it. 2.6. 2.6. Alimony. For divorce or separation agreement, instruments executed after December 31st, 2018, Alimony payments to an ex-spouse are no longer deductible. Now, they used to be deductible. 
If you pay alimony, it used to be deductible, something you can write off. If you had to pay alimony to your spouse, you can write that off on your taxes. You can no longer do that. That's a part of the TCJA, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, that was enacted December 31st, 2017, which means everything kicks off that next year because they had times and, and dates that set off when things kicked off and when they started and stopped inside of the TCJA of 2017. OK, now that also means. Because you can't write it off, that means the other party does not have to treat it like income because I was able to write it off. I can write off alimony. And write it off on my taxes, that means the other party, the other spouse had to receive it as income and put it on their taxes. Well, that's no longer required. That's the most important thing you need to know about alimony. All right. 2.7, we're going into the big time. We're in the big time. We're making great time. Anybody got any questions, any burning questions that I need to cover before I jump into the Schedule C? Because this is one of the most important lessons that we're going to have through this entire uh, course, online course for this 2023-2024 boot camp is a Schedule C, all right? I may not even be able to finish the Schedule C lesson within this particular class. Typically, I would take two to three sessions to do Schedule C because it's such a powerful and important piece of your tax profile. So let's go ahead and jump right in it. Schedule C, Form 1040, profit or loss from a business, is used to report income or loss from a business the taxpayer operates as a sole proprietor. And that any an activity qualifies as a business if the primary, the taxpayer's primary purpose for engaging in that activity is for income or profit. All right, I'm gonna stop right there because there's some specific things that you guys really have to know about this. In order for it to be considered to be a, a, a properly operated and run business and not just some paperwork scam business is an activity qualifies as a business. If the taxpayers primary purpose for engaging in the activity is for income or profit. Your primary purpose has to be for income or profits, okay? In addition, Schedule C is used to report wages and expenses as a statutory employee. Very few people are become statutory employees nowadays. That is something that you will very rarely see. Um, you could do this for 20, 30, 40 years and never see a statutory employee W-2 where they didn't take the taxes out and that person gets to take their W-2 and then write off business expenses. The government really discourages that and you won't see that very often. Self-employed. A taxpayer is self-employed if they carry on a trade or business as a sole proprietor or an independent contractor. So that means whether you got that 1099 from them people or not, you're still considered to be sole proprietor or an independent contractor, okay? An activity qualifies as a trade or business if the primary purpose for engaging in the activity is for income or profit and the taxpayer is involved in the activity with continuity and regularity, all right? Continuity and regularity. That means... You need to be operating the business often. You need to be actually working this business every week, every month. Show some real business activities. Because if not, they're going to consider it to be a hobby. If you want your business to be treated properly, you need to engage in it for income and profits. And you need to engage in this business with continuity and regularity. Self-employment tax of a sole proprietor is 15.3%, which is the equivalent to Social Security and Medicare tax withholding from an employee. Self-employment taxes. This is not the federal taxes. This is taxes on top of your federal taxes. And the reason why the government takes this from you is because if you work the job, you will be paying federal taxes, state taxes, depending on where you live, but you'd also be paying Social Security and Medicare. So if you operate a business, they expect the same things to be paid. The only difference is you get to write off a, a, a credit for half of it. 
And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Certain workers are independent contractors under the common law rules, but employees by statute. The following workers are considered to be statutory employees. A driver who distributes beverages, full-time life insurance salesman, an individual who works from home on goods and materials for their employer, or a full-time traveling salesperson. All right, the accounting method. The employer withholds Social Security and Medicare taxes from the wages of statutory employees, just like they do on a regular one, and they put it on a W-2. But your accounting method is a set of rules used to determine when to report your income. That's what the accounting method is. It's just about when do you account for your income. All right, I just heard a beep. Somebody's probably coming in. Somebody's coming in. All right, gotcha. All right. Uh-oh, got another one. Let's see. Here we go. All right. Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> now, when do you report your income and expenses? You guys probably think it's silly, but I've had a lot of people that have said, hey, look, um, man, I forgot. Come, hey, Dr. Gino, you got to help me out, man. Help me out, bro. Look, um, I got this. Uh, I got my taxes done by these other people because I was trying to save five dollars because, you know, I'm cheap. So instead of coming to you, I went down the street to some other folks. They hurried up and did my taxes and got me advanced and everything. They did all this stuff for me, man. But I forgot one of my W-2s. Um, can I um just put this on my next year taxes? Hell no. To the no, no. If you got a 23 W-2, it goes on your 23 tax return. If you got a 2020 W-2, it goes on your 2020 tax return. Well, when it comes to businesses, the rules are the same. Only difference is you get to choose your own method of when you're going to report income and expenses. Go ahead and drop cash in the chat if you're still awake. Cash. You have the cash method or you have the accrual method. Okay? Those are the two methods that you can use for recording your money. Now, I'm not going to read all this to you. I'm going to break it down Barney style so we can keep it moving. Stay on track. Always encourage your customers, if they have a business, to use the cash method. You don't want to be getting fancy like that unless you have a large corporation. Large corporations have reasons for why they account for their income and expenses in a different period than when it actually came in and when they used it. But for small businesses, it makes no sense. It's extra paperwork, it costs extra money, and it makes things very difficult to manage. Always encourage them to go with the cash method. Now let's talk about the difference in the cash method versus the accrual method. The accrual method says, hey, I'm going to record this money on my books when I earn the money. Meaning somebody might have paid me for a carpet cleaning service. If I got a carpet cleaning service business, they might have paid me $5,000 to clean all the carpets in this big building. And... November of 2023, but I didn't do the work yet because it's not scheduled to be done until February 2024. So I'm not going to put that money on my books and pay taxes on it in 23. I'm going to put it in 24. That would be the accrual method. That means you're doing it when you earned it, okay, in the year earned. That's what the accrual method means. You do it in the year that you earned it, meaning once you finally get the job completed, and you know you can actually keep it because you completed the job, that's when you report the money. That's not what regular small businesses do. Those are large corporations that are being paid millions and millions of dollars prepaid sometimes in advance for things that are happening next year. Every small business in America should be using the cash method. And all that means is you record it when it comes in. You record it as soon as you touch it, as soon as you receive it, whether you've done the services or not. For example, in my business, I have people that prepay for services sometimes. I don't like it when they prepay, but at the same time, I'm okay with taking that money because I'm in the business to make money. All right, so let's use myself as an example. I have somebody paying me for bookkeeping or payroll services, and they want to drop five or 10 grand on pay for some services. Well, if I hadn't done the work yet, I have multiple bank accounts, multiple business bank accounts, and I don't really want to spend the money because I hadn't earned it yet. But I don't want to use the accrual method because that starts to get really funky, really hard accounting work. 
I'm using the cash method. So I just put the money in one of my other accounts and I'm not going to touch it or, or spend it. But I'm still going to use the cash method, meaning when I do my 2023 taxes, I'm going to record that I've already got that money and pay taxes on it for 23. All right. Most people are just going to take it and spend it anyway. But for me, if I haven't finished the work, I have somebody pay me half up front and half when the work is done. Sometimes I might not feel comfortable spending that money because I don't have any issues with the customer. And then we end up canceling the job or they don't ever finish paying everything out. I want to be paid. You know, I'm not going to spend it until I'm done. Because if I have to give a refund for some reason, I need to be ready. I also don't like holding on to money that don't belong to me. When money come to my accounts, I like to get it gone. You know, I work with a bunch of tax preparers, just like jet tax. So sometimes money is flowing into one account. Then it has to be pushed over to you through a payroll or something. I try to hurry up and get that money out of my account and get it where it's supposed to go. But cash method is what we're going to use. Let's talk about the determination of your gross income and deductions. If there's a connection between any income received and the business, then the income is considered to be business income. The income is business income. All right. So you don't ever have to worry about trying to figure out, well, should I consider this business income or not? If there is a connection between any income that you received and your business, that is business income. Gross receipts. This is on the Schedule C. When you're doing gross receipts, that just pretty much means all the money that came in. All right? Let's break this thing down, Barney's out. That means all the money that came in. Money that came in by cash. Money that came in by credit cards. Money that came in directly from the tax bank. Money that came by check. Money that came through Cash App and everything. You put it all there. That's breaking it down, Barney's out. Let's see what the textbook says about it. The gross receipts from a trade of business are ended on Schedule C, Part 1. This amount includes all income. See how we just broke it down, Barney Sound? All income. Even money that came in on a 1099K. All right? All income. We're breaking it down, Barney Sound. Let's talk about inventory. So we already talked about the income coming in for a business. We're doing Schedule C now. Schedule C for businesses. We talked about the income that you have to put on the Schedule C. Well, let's talk about inventory and cost of goods sold. Us, we are tax preparers. So as tax professionals, we provide a service, not a product. So you shouldn't have anything on the cost of goods sold section of your business if it's a service business. But sometimes service businesses also sell products in the process. For example, in the process, for example. I know a guy who sells window treatments, blinds, fancy, expensive blinds for big buildings and stuff like that. So he has to go buy the stuff, the materials to install the blinds, window dressings and things like that. And then he sells it to the customer and sells it and sells the service fee to install it. So for his business, he does have cost of goods sold. Then you also have people who don't provide services. All they do is sell products. They have cost of goods sold. If you buy, if you have any products related to the money you're getting from your customer, not just services, if I'm selling you some kind of product, you will have cost of goods sold. And all that means is, let's break it down, bonus out. The money that I had to pay to get the stuff. For example, if I'm selling coffee mugs, okay, and I sell my coffee mugs for 20 bucks a piece, the cost of goods sold is how much did I have to pay to get each one of those? I paid 10 bucks a piece to get the co coffee mugs and I sold them for 20 bucks a piece. The 10 bucks a piece that I paid to get them is the cost of goods sold. All right. Very simple. Breaking it down Barney style. So that means I got a 50% profit margin. That's my gross profit margin. I pay 10 bucks for the cup and I sell them for 20 bucks. That's what you need to know about cost of goods sold, breaking it down. But the only thing you need to know is inventories when you're working with a business that has products you want to make sure that they're taking an inventory every year at the end of the year because you need to know what the beginning inventory was january 1st and you need to know what the ending inventory is which is do they have 500 dollars worth of stuff still in inventory or do they have five million dollars worth of stuff in a warehouse or in a storage room or in their garage somewhere because you can only write off the ones that you sold that's the most important rule you can only write off the ones that you sold. For example, 
I can write off all the boxes that I bought, the tape, the labels for me shipping this stuff out. Those are that's considered to be materials and supplies. But when it comes to the actual coffee mugs, if I bought a thousand coffee mugs for the year, that's my cost of goods sold because I'm trying to um, sell these things. I can't write off a thousand coffee mugs. I can only write off the amount on the ones that I sold. The ones that I sold. So I bought a thousand coffee mugs, right? I only sold 500 of them. So how many can I write off? I can only write off the 500 that I sold. $10 a cup times the 500 of them that I sold. So, hey, Dr. Gino, that's not fair. I bought another 500 coffee mugs that I can't write off. What's going on with that? That's not considered to be a business expense. It's considered to be an asset, just like cash. All right. Remember, we're talking about business. So a lot of a lot of us have to grow out of the street mentality and get down, get beyond the basic level hustling to make money mentality and realize that business has to be conducted professionally. And there's a set of rules that are associated with business. OK. Those rules are. Uh, as a part of accounting, not only do you have your cash method, but you have different types of accounts. You have cash, you have assets like furniture or items cost of goods sold that you want to sell. You have liabilities, which is money that you owe. Well, when you take cash out of the bank, which is an asset, to go and buy your goods that you're going to sell, sell, the cost of goods sold, you didn't lose money. You didn't lose any assets. Your balance sheet says, I have $500 worth of coffee mugs and I have $500 in cash in the bank. That still means my business is worth $1,000, all right? Now, if I had $1,000 in cash, it's still worth the same thousand, but you don't lose money. All you did was trade your cash for the cost of goods. So you have $500 worth of goods and you have $500 worth of cash. But you can't write that off just because you bought them because you didn't sell them. You can only write off the amount that you sold. So what does all this mean, Dr. Gino? This sounds really complicated. It's not complicated at all. You just have to make sure when you're dealing with a customer that has a product business and you're getting ready to do their little Schedule C for their tax return, you have to make sure that you find out how much their inventory is. How much do you have in inventory right now? How much did you have in inventory at the beginning of the year? How much did you have in inventory at the end of the year? Okay. How many did you sell? All right. That's the only thing you need to know because you dropped that in the. Just a little secret just between us. When you do the cost of goods section on a product business, you can just put in the amount that they purchased and sold if you want to in the cost of goods section on the Schedule C. You don't even really have to put in the beginning and ending inventory. You can skip that part if you want to. Now, if you want to be thorough and you want to be a great tax professional, you will take the time to at least ask your customer, could you estimate how much you think you have in inventory? Now, the inventory numbers are very important when it comes to cost of goods sold. I'm going to give you guys another little tidbit, another little hint to help you out, because you might be going back to watch this video when the time comes for you to do a return for somebody that has a product business. That is also the way that the government expects for you to calculate how much your cost of goods sold is. For example, if you have zero inventory at the beginning of the year, and then you bought, um, you had zero at the beginning of the year, you bought a thousand coffee mugs to sell, then you only sold 300, then your, your ending inventory will be 700, right? So you have your purchases minus your inventory. That should equal your cost of goods sold. So your cost of goods sold should pretty much be your purchases minus the inventory that you still have in. A very simple example. Let's use iPhones this time instead of coffee mugs, something that's more interesting. Let's talk about iPhones. If I own a little cell phone store, or even if I work from home and I just hustle hustle phones and sell them online. And I bought a thousand iPhones to sell for the year. All right. It should my record should match up. If at the end of the year I have 700 iPhones left, 
How many did I sell? I sold 300. All right, and those records should kind of match up. But it doesn't have to be exact. You just need to be as close as possible, okay? All right, materials and supplies. This is not the same as cost of goods sold. People mis misunderstand this often. Cost of goods sold is the actual stuff that you are selling. That does not include boxes, tape, and all these other things. Materials and supplies means tangible property used or consumed in the taxpayer's operations, meaning you use these things for your business or you consume them. In the process of you using a roll of tape, you bought a roll of tape, that's not an asset. That's not a cost of goods sold. That's not something you're going to sell to the customer. The customer is not paying you for the tape you put on the box, okay? That's something that you use or consume. At some point, that roll of tape will be gone and you get another one and another one and another one. So you use it or consume it. Remember, you can write that off. So your customers should have a good idea of what they've spent on these different items throughout the year if they're having good records, whether it's a notebook or an Excel document, a spreadsheet, or if they're paying somebody like you or me to do professional bookkeeping and payroll for them, all right? So let's talk about some more business expenses. Let's go into the definition of business expenses and look at, we already talked about what it takes for the government to consider your business to be legitimate, meaning you have to intend to make a profit and you need to be involved with the business with continuity and regularity, meaning often, right? Well, let's talk about what the government thinks in respect to legitimate business expenses, legit business expenses, deduct any expenses that are ordinary and necessary. That's what you gotta know, remember, it has to intend to make a profit. You have to be operating that business with continuity and regularity. And the last piece is you can deduct any expenses that are ordinary and necessary. What does that mean, Dr. Gino? Break it down. What that means is I am a tax practitioner. I've been doing this for 20 years. Okay. Now, my business is legitimate and I'm operating and filing taxes, I'm doing what the government requires for me to do. However, in the process of me operating a tax practice or a payroll practice or an accounting practice, we own our own firm. So that means I need supplies, that's ordinary and necessary, right? I'm gonna have y'all do some yes or no for me. I'm gonna make sure y'all still awake. I'm gonna call off a couple of things and I want you guys to tell me whether or not you think this is ordinary or necessary for an accounting firm owner, for an accounting firm business? Um, yes or no, is printer paper ordinary and necessary? I'm gonna watch the chat now and see what y'all put in there. Is that yes or no? Is printer paper for me to print out tax returns, is that ordinary or necessary? Yes or no? Tanya Terrell, thank you. First one. All right. Um. Let's talk about the printer. My printer broke and I bought another one. Can I write that off? Is that ordinary and necessary? Yes. All right. Um, let's talk about my business vehicle. Um, I can write off the mileage. We all know I can write off the mileage for using my vehicle for business, but what if I wanted to buy an airplane? If I had the money, my accounting firm was making enough money, could I buy an airplane? Is that ordinary or necessary? What y'all think? Tanya Terrell says, no. Hell no. It's not ordinary or necessary for an accountant to have an airplane. It is not necessary. So, you guys have to think about those kind of things when you're dealing with your tax clients because some of these folks are going to sit some weird stuff in front of you. If you are the type of tax professional that meets with customers in person, sometimes they're going to bring you some receipts for some weird stuff, y'all. All right? And if you're one of those people who do everything online, you're going to have people text and email you some weird stuff. For example, y'all probably ain't going to believe this. I have uh, clients all over the USA. I even have customers overseas. Our business is not a very big business. It's a medium-sized, a normal, ordinary tax office. 
Um, but we do have customers in a variety of places, okay? So I get tax returns from overseas every now and then. I talk to a guy in Lithuania, you know, once or twice a month. Um, Afghanistan, Iraq, um, Belgium. I've worked with people, UK, Mexico. I've got clients every year that comes to me that live overseas, okay? Now, it's okay to rearrange your money the way you want to as long as you have the right stuff. But guess what? Sometimes I have this guy, I had a guy from Virginia send me a box of all his stuff. Sometimes I have people send me trash bags full of receipts and stuff that I got to go through because they didn't keep the bookkeeping. They didn't pay for the bookkeeping to have it done and organized properly throughout the year. So now I got to go through all of it at once. And yes, I'm charging them extra for that. But one of the weirdest things I got in, in the thing is all these lottery tickets. Lottery tickets. Why are you writing off the lottery tickets? All right, on a, uh, from you guys, yes or no? Is lottery ticket ordinary and necessary to operate a business? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So I had to explain to him, look, but I'm curious. I like to learn from other people. Sometimes I like to laugh, too. I'll laugh at you, or but I will laugh with you. And when it's my turn to be in trouble, I'll laugh at myself. But I asked the guy, why you... <laughs> Why do you think you can write off lottery tickets? He's like, yeah, because uh, I do that to uh, I buy lottery tickets for people sometimes and I give them away. And uh, yeah, that's my way of helping the community. You know, I pay a dollar here for a ticket, dollar there for a ticket, and hand it to somebody, you know, and, you know, that's how I give back to the community. Like this, sir, this is a business, not a charity. This is not a nonprofit. Remember, the business has to be to intend to make a profit. And the expenses have to be ordinary and necessary. It's not ordinary and necessary. And you ain't making no profits by buying lottery tickets, even though if you win, you could make a profit. But that's not a business unless you are a professional gambler. All right? Unless you're in the gambling business, there are some professional gamblers out there. All right, business interest. You can deduct business interest. All right, let's talk about that. What does that mean? Every business is generally subject to a disallowance of an interest expense deduction in excess of 30% of the business's adjusted taxable income. All that means is you can write off interest for the business, but it can't be too high. You can't have only $100,000 that came in for the year and you're writing off $70,000 in interest. That's 70% of the money that came in. So all they're saying is there's a limit. 30% is the limit. But you have interest on a business loan, business interest on a vehicle loan, interest on whatever, you can write that off. Travel, travel expenses. Self-employed taxpayers can take a deduction for the business use of their vehicles. That business mileage, remember the first class? We talked about the business mileage rate going up. Doesn't matter whether you're taking a long trip out of state to meet with business partners and to do some business, or if you're just traveling down the road. You could be traveling from Albany to Valdosta, or from Albany to Atlanta, or from Atlanta to Savannah, or from Atlanta down to Clearwater to come see me. Come on to Clearwater, Florida, and come visit. Now, you can write off that business mileage. You can do local transportation, and you can be away from home overnight and then write off your hotel stays as well. But it needs to be ordinary and necessary. So let's talk about ordinary and necessary again when it comes to travel. Because ordinary and necessary applies to each one of the expenses that we're going to go into. So each category has its own category. Each category has its own category. Each expense has its own category. But not only that, but you have to consider whether it's ordinary and necessary in each one. For example, if I'm traveling and I'm leaving Clearwater, Florida, where it's nice and warm to come all the way to Georgia to see some of y'all, let's just say I'm, we're going to meet up in Atlanta and have a meeting. We're going to have a big old tax meeting. Big old tax powwow party. I'm going to write this off on my taxes, right? Is it ordinary and necessary for me to stay at the Holiday Inn because I'm in Atlanta? Absolutely. It's ordinary and necessary to get a, a, a hotel at the Holiday Inn. It's also ordinary and necessary if I want to upgrade a little bit and get a hotel at the Embassy Suites. But remember, the meals and incidentals, the per diem says how much the total is supposed to be so you don't go over that amount. Remember that. 
So if you want to get a nicer hotel, you can, but you're going to pay the difference because the government's only going to allow you to write off X, Y, Z amount per night of a hotel stay. Is it ordinary and necessary for me to stay at the Ritz Carlton in Atlanta? Absolutely not. And the government's not going to let you write off staying in very nice places so you can kick it and have a great time and not pay taxes on that money. The government allows $97 a night for lodging or $105. That's what you get. If your hotel room is $700 a night because you're staying at the Ritz, that's on you, player. That's on you. All right. Standard mileage rate. Use the standard mileage rate only if the business owner owns the vehicle and uses a standard mileage rate for the first year. Meaning you can't flip back and forth to saying, well, I'm going to write off gas and oil changes and all that stuff. And then I'm going to flip back to using mileage. No, you use one or the other. Once you start using mileage on that vehicle, you have to continue. But mileage is worth way more than the actual expenses on a vehicle. And that's a lot of freaking work. Don't let your customers fool you like that. Mileage rate is worth a lot. If you were drive 10,000 miles, the mileage rate is 65 cents a mile. Now, that's $6,500. That's probably enough to cover your whole car note. That makes your whole vehicle free. Why would you want to waste my time and have me working extra when you're not trying to pay extra? So that's how I, just, I explain it. If you want me to do the actual cost of this vehicle and write off this vehicle for you, you're going to pay extra. It's going to cost you an extra $300. Oh, yeah, I thought so. You don't want to pay the extra $300. We're using the standard mileage rate, buddy, because it's easy. However many miles times 65 cents. Good write-off. You can do it every year over and over and over again, no matter how old that vehicle gets. Now, if you do the actual cost of that vehicle, it's crazy. I got to take the cost of that vehicle, figure out the useful life for that vehicle. See, so, yeah, people think they're going to just bring you gas receipts or the car note. I want to write off. I'm going to use the actual expense. No, the hell you not. That's not what the law says. It's not what the rules say. The laws and the rules say you take the cost of that vehicle and you figure out whether it has a seven-year life, a five-year life, or a 10-year life. Then you divide up the cost across the years and you write off some of it this year, some of it the next year, some of it the other years, and you got to keep up with it. Then you got to do the depreciation, which is how much does it depreciate and lose value over time. Then if you sell a vehicle, you got to put all the depreciation back and then at that point, now i got to take a percentage of my oil changes, a percentage of my gas, not just the gas price, but the percentage of the gas. And you got all this math that has to be done. When if you did all of that work, it wouldn't even come up to nowhere close to a, the amount of money you would get for the standard mileage rate. You could do all that work and find out you drove 20, 30,000 miles for the year. You could have got uh, $10,000. You know, you could have got a, Ten or twenty thousand dollar deduction for it, but instead you done done all this math because you want to be fancy or you because you listen to somebody on the internet telling you you can write off your gas, and you keep bringing these pile of receipts and now you paying me an extra three hundred dollars, and instead of getting a big write off, now you're getting a write off one thousand eight hundred and thirty three dollars. Trust me, when you do the math, the standard mileage rate is better. The standard mileage rate is better for us as tax professionals because it's simpler and easier. However, if you want to do it. We could do one while we're doing one of our classes. If you guys want to do some depreciation to, so I can show you how to do the depreciation on a rental property or how to do the depreciation on a vehicle, I can save one of our courses and some time to do one. I'll log into the software and do one so you guys can see it, but it don't even make no sense. All right. The standard mileage rate. However you start, that's how you keep going. This is what I was telling you guys about actual expenses. Okay. You go ahead and do it, but it's going to be some math involved. a portion of oil, gas, insurance, and all that. After you figure out the portion that's business-related and the portion that's personal-related, and you figure out the cost, the full life, useful life of that property and all of that. All right, it's after 11. We're going to pick up next week on page 49. We're making our way through this book pretty good, y'all. We're going to come back to employees' pay. We'll start here and finish the Schedule C. Remember, everything we're doing now is about Business, Schedule C, which is business income and loss, business income and expenses. Any burning questions you guys got for me before we go, before we close out for the day? Any burning questions? All right. I don't see any questions coming through on my chat. I will see you guys here 
next week, same bat time, same bat channel. All right. I'll see y'all in a little while. As soon as this video is done converting, I will go ahead and upload it to our channel where you can see all the videos all in one place. There's a link for the, the playlist that shows all the videos that we're covering through our boot camp. So if you miss one, you can go back and check it out. Or if you want to listen to one again, you can go back and re-listen to it. Other than that, thank you so much, Miss Tanya. I appreciate y'all. Um, I will see y'all next week. Y'all have a great day. Enjoy your weekend. Happy holidays.